Hey guys, welcome back to Joanne's Learning Hub. Today we'll be learning about space physics. This is about the motion of the earth and the moon. Day and night are caused by the earth spinning on its axis. So what do we call a day? A day is one complete rotation about the earth's axis that takes around 24 hours. The moon orbits the earth in 28 days which is almost a month. We know that the moon does not glow itself, but it reflects the light from the sun. So only the half which is facing the sun is lit up and that's what we see, leaving the other side in the shadow. When the moon orbits the earth, we see different amounts of the moon lit up and dark surfaces. This is what we call the phases of the moon. The earth orbits the sun once in every 365 days, which is almost a year. So each year has four seasons. The seasons are caused by the tilt of the Earth's axis. When it is summer in Northern Hemisphere, it is winter in Southern Hemisphere and vice versa. As we saw in the previous slide, the seasons are caused by the tilt of the Earth's axis and the motion of the Earth around the Sun. The equinoxes is when the night and day are equal in both hemispheres and when the sun rises exactly in the east and sets exactly in the west. For the northern hemisphere, the spring equinox is on the 21st of March, autumnal equinox is on the 22nd of September, summer solstice is on the 21st of June and winter solstice is on the 21st of December. So in the summer solstice of the northern hemisphere, everything above the equator, which is the northern hemisphere, is tilted towards the sun. So it spends more time in sunlight and it has longer days and shorter nights. So it gets more hours of sunshine, the land heats up. And this sunshine is focused on a smaller area of land and this is what makes the land heat up and the area experiences summer. In winter solstice in northern hemisphere, the, it is tilted away from the sun. So it spends lesser time in sunlight, it has shorter days and longer nights. The sun's rays cover a larger area of land so the heat is more spread out and the area gets colder so it experiences winter. These are the phases of the moon. We can calculate the average speed of an orbit using the equation average orbital speed is equal to 2 pi r upon t where r represents the average radius of the orbit which is the average distance from the center of the object being orbited to the center of the object orbiting it and t represents the orbital uh, period which is the time it takes for the object to complete one full orbit. So how did our solar system form? Uh, the best idea or theory of how our solar system formed is the accretion model. So this accretion model states that the solar system originated from a big rotating cloud of interstellar dust and gas and uh, the nebula began to co collapse in itself, uh, material and density absorbed into the center. Soon the sun forms which is surrounded by an accretion disk. So this accretion disk is a disk of dust and gas that orbits around an object which is usually a star at its center. The temperature was very high close to the sun and get, got lower as you got further away from it. So areas of high density got denser and hotter and eventually the matter was compressed to form planets. Heavier substances close to the sun form the terrestrial planets which we now call Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. These planets are small and mostly made of rocky substances. Lighter substances such as gases gathered further away from the sun and these have formed the gas giant planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. They are much larger than the terrestrial planets. So next up is galaxy. A galaxy is a collection of billions of stars. So we are part of our Milky Way galaxy and our sun is just one of the many billions of stars which are part of the Milky Way galaxy. Our sun is about halfway along one of the spiral arms of the Milky Way. 
So the center of the Milky Way, which is a spiral galaxy, is a supermassive black hole. The force that keeps stars together in a galaxy is gravity. So galaxies rotate, as does our Milky Way, uh, and the universe is mostly empty space, and it is really big. The solar system. So our solar system uh, is located in an outer spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy, uh, and our solar system consists of the sun, which is our star, and everything else which is bound to it by gravity. Uh, the planets, which is Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, dwarf planets like Pluto, uh, several moons, asteroids, comets, and meteoroids. The planets orbit the star and moons which are natural satellites orbit the planets. So a planet is a large object that orbits a star. A moon is a uh, moons are natural satellites and they orbit planets with almost circular orbits. Artificial satellites are human made satellites which orbit the earth in fairly circular orbits. Comets are lumps of ice and dust that orbit the sun and their orbits are highly elliptical so it's like a stretched out circle uh, some travel from near to the sun to the outskirts of our solar system and back again minor planets is like any object which orbits the sun that isn't a planet or a comet there are two types of minor planets uh, one is dwarf planets like pluto they aren't big enough to be called planets Whereas the second one is asteroids, which is lumps of rock and metal that orbit the sun. Uh, asteroids are found in the asteroid belt. There are some trends in the properties of planets. In general, the greater the average orbital radius or orbital distance, the greater the orbital period. As the planet travels slower as it has to move through a larger distance so that it can complete its orbit. The lower the density of the planets. So the inner four planets, which is Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, they are rocky planets, so they have almost the same density. Uh, the outer four planets, which is Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, they have much lower densities as they are made of gas. Lower the surface temperature of the planets. So as you go further out, the planets absorb lesser energy from the sun. An exception to this is Venus as uh, Venus has higher temperature than Mercury because it has more carbon dioxide in its atmosphere. Uh, for most planets, higher the mass, stronger its gravitational field strength. Stellar evolution, that is the life cycle of stars. Stars initially form from a nebula and nebula is a hydrogen containing interstellar cloud of dust and gas. So the internal gravitational attraction of this interstellar cloud pulls everything together to form a protostar. The temperature rises as the star gets denser and um, once the temperature is high enough, hydrogen nuclei undergoes nuclear fusion to form helium nuclei. This gives huge amounts of energy which keeps the core of the star hot and thus a star is born. Then after this, a star, the star enters a long stable period. In this stable period, uh, the outward pressure which is caused by the thermal expansion uh, balances the force of gravity which tries to pull everything inwards. Mm, the stable period of a star lasts for several billion years. The larger the mass of the star, the shorter its time in the stable period. So now eventually the hydrogen in the core begins to run out as most of it has been converted to helium. So uh, the fusion of helium and other elements occurs in the core and soon the outer layers of the star begin to expand. So now we must know that stars which are about the same size as the sun will form a red giant. Whereas stars which are much massive and much more bigger than the sun will form red supergiants. Uh, this red giant will then become unstable and eject its outer layers to form a planetary nebula. Now a planetary nebula is a cloud of dust and gas from which planets can form. At 
the center of the planetary nebula is a hot dense solid core which we can call a white dwarf now big stars which uh, have formed red super giants will start to glow brightly again and will undergo more fusion to make much more heavier elements uh, they'll expand and contract several times and uh, soon they will explode into a supernova the exploding supernova will throw out the layers of dust and gas into space uh, forming a nebula containing hydrogen and heavier elements so this nebula can go on to form new stars with orbiting planets a lower mass supergiant will leave a very dense core called a neutron star but if the supergiant is massive enough its core can collapse and form a black hole and a black hole is a super dense region of space from which not even light can escape this is a detailed description about stellar evolution which we went through in the previous slide the universe is a large collection of billions of galaxies our universe includes all of the space matter stars galaxies and also the energy that space contains the age of the universe is approximately 13.8 billion years old far back in time the whole universe was compressed into a tiny spot called the singularity and after the big bang space expanded and our stars galaxies and planets formed So in the past the universe was smaller hotter and denser than it is today research also shows that the universe is expanding which means that galaxies are moving farther away from each other so in the distant future galaxies may be so far away that their light may not even reach earth which means that the light is redshifted so what is redshift exactly Redshift is an increase in the observed wavelength of electromagnetic radiation emitted from stars and galaxies that are receding that is moving away from an observer on earth. So redshift occurs when a light source is moving away whereas blue shift occurs if the light source is moving towards us. Uh, we can say that if a wave source is moving towards an observer the frequency of the wave is higher and the wavelength is shorter that's the blue shift whereas if the wave source is moving away from the observer frequency of the wave will be lower and wavelength will be longer and that is the red shift so astronomers on earth with who observe the uh, light emitted from distant galaxies see that it has longer wavelength and lower frequency compared to the light emitted on earth so this shows that the light emitted by those galaxies has red shifted so the galaxies must be moving away from the earth the most common source of red shift is the doppler effect other sources are expansion and gravity the doppler effect is a change in wavelength and frequency of either light or sound as a source Uh, and the observer are moving either closer together or farther apart this is a pictorial representation of red shift and blue shift the second image we can see here the source of light is moving away from the earth so the light it emits reaches earth with lesser energy so we say that it has red shifted In the third image we can see that the source is moving towards the earth so the light will reach the earth with more intensity and energy and we say it has blue shifted astronomers also refer to this as negative red shift We learned in the previous slides that galaxies are slowly moving away that is they are receding uh, from the earth so this suggests that there must have been something which must have given them the initial start this may be a big explosion which we call the big bang the big bang theory states that initially all the matter in the universe occupied a single point this tiny space was very dense and very hot the single point then exploded which is what we call the big bang and from then on space has started expanding and the expansion is still going on so we have two evidences which support the big bang theory one is the red shift which we covered in the previous slide and the cosmic microwave background radiation cmbr 
so cmbr is microwave re- radiation of a specific a uh, low frequency which comes from all directions and all parts of the universe it was produced shortly after the universe is have was formed and according to the big bang theory the cmbr is the leftover radiation from the initial explosion the speed of a galaxy depends on its distance from the earth so we have learned that the light from galaxies is redshifted because all the galaxies are moving away from each other so if we plot a graph of speed at which galaxies are moving away from the earth uh, and the distance of the galaxies from earth we will understand that the speed and distance are proportional that means that the speed galaxies move away from us is greater the further away they move from us so as speed increases distance increases vice versa and vice versa so we have our uh, hubble constant which is equal to the speed of galaxy upon the distance of galaxy from the earth so we measure the speed of galaxy in meter per second and distance of galaxy from earth in meters So a current estimate for the Hubble constant is approximately 2.2 into 10 to the power minus 18 per second. Do remember to like, share and subscribe to my channel for more videos. Thank you.